Welcome to another issue of uh, Government Affairs, another opportunity for us to come together and examine various issues related to government. And uh, today we have a very special privilege, and I will let Warner introduce our guest in a minute. But first of all, presentations such as this could not happen without our sponsors whom we value greatly. And today I want to give special recognition to our presenting sponsors. That would be Portland General Electric and Riverview Community Bank. So we want to thank those two organizations for their assistance. And I also would like to thank our education sponsor, the Gresham Barlow School District. Their support also is helpful in providing this aspect of education to our community. I want to recognize some of our elected officials that are in our room today. Uh, Shirley Craddock, Metro Councillor, Shirley over there. Uh, Kirk French, City Councillor, there's Kirk over there. Uh, Michael McCormick, thank you Michael for being here. And then also we have a number of board members from the Gresham Chamber that are present. I want to recognize Lynn Snodgrass, who is our current president. Lynn, thank you for your leadership. <laughs> Matt Miller is our past president. <laughs> Emphasis on the word past. <laughs> Andrea Pickett with I4 Marketing. Uh, Jim Hathaway. And uh, John um, Mullaney. John. Maloney. John Maloney. I know that. John's the skier guy. And you're heading to Mexico any day, aren't you? Yes. Thursday morning. Thursday morning. Looking forward to that. Well, thank you for our board members who are here. And Warner Allen also is a board member. I'm going to ask him to come forward now. He is the chairman of our Government Affairs Committee. And Warner will... Uh, introduce our special guest today. So I just wanted to say Matt Miller is the happiest guy in the room. <laughs> Being past president, right? So Mayor Bemis was born in Billings, Montana, moved to Gresham uh, with his family when he was 15 years old, one day before starting high school at Gresham High School. He um, was introduced to politics apparently by his mother, who was very involved in the Montana political scene. And it's said that he caught the bug working for the family-owned department store, which happened to be a popular spot for local government officials during his high school years. Um, in his late 20s, Mayor Bemis opened a Bellagio Pizzeria franchise in Gresham, which led to his belief that the town would benefit from being governed by someone with more than just a passing business background. In 2002, he was elected to city council. In 2007, he was sworn in as Gresham's 26th mayor at the age of 34, making him the youngest person to hold the position in Gresham's history. He was re-elected to a second term in November 2010, a third term in November of 2014. Mayor Bemis has brought a passion for economic development, business, and community safety to City Hall. In October 2013, as some of you know, Mayor Bemis was one of seven mayors across the country highlighted in Esquire magazine's Age of the Mayor article showcasing Gresham's garage to storefront progress and its program, which ushered in 144 new small businesses in previously vacant storefronts in Gresham's key commercial areas. And the city's energy efficient money saving upgrades of LED street light bulbs. Some say uh, the Esquire magazine was really all about his dress and his suave air. <laughs> Mayor Remus continues to work as a restaurateur in Gresham, owning uh, Bocelli's in downtown Gresham in the historic district. And if you haven't been there, you need to go. And if you have been, you need to go again. As he once commented, one of the reasons I love local government is that it doesn't matter if you're an R or a D, it matters on what's best for this community. So please welcome to our podium, Gresham's Mayor, Shane Venus. <laughs> Well, 
thank you very much. And uh, can, can you hear me okay? Is that? No? I know that we need, okay. Well, I'll try and, do you want me to hold this one as well? Where'd she go? Is this one? Is this? Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be here. I always love to come uh, to governmental affairs. Um, as Warner mentioned, uh, you know, I spent a little bit of time uh, as the chair of the government affairs for a while um, when the county roads were a big issue and it was a lot of fun and uh, cut my first teeth in, in uh, politics through the chamber and through the government affairs. But beyond that, <clears throat> I can tell you uh, that I know, having opened my business, I would have never been successful had I not gotten to know the folks in the chamber and worked the chamber and, and uh, created really uh, lasting friendships and relationships in order to help me be successful. So thank you for that. Thank you for all that the, the chamber continues uh, to do. Um, so I, I thought what we would do is just briefly touch a little bit about some of the items that were in the state of the city address um, and then uh, really just open it up for questions and answers and just have a, a real dialogue. I think that's generally where we have the most fun and, and the most candidness rather than on prepared uh, remarks. And if I know anything about this group, they're candid, if not anything else. So, um, so since I gave this state of the city about a month, uh, about a month ago, um, there was a couple particular focuses in the state of the city, and I know that, that some of you uh, were there <clears throat> for that, but a couple of them were economic development, obviously, that we want to talk about, and the other was on our, our children and families. Um, there's no question that it's an important time in, in Gresham when it comes to remaining competitive and meeting the needs of our children and our families. Um, my focus at the moment is directly on this topic and be it recreational opportunities, family amenities like community centers, or quite frankly, the quality of our schools. Though I recognize that uh, the city is a partner in that arena and not fully in control. Um, I'm very bullish about Gresham, um, but I think that we can all recognize that we exist within a competitive regional market and our families have choices about where they want to live. And we don't want to see them get lured away. So we got a lot of work to do uh, in that regard. That's as bad for business as it is for our community fabric when we have people that are, uh, have grown up in this community and aren't staying here and they're moving to other places. Um, in the short term, as I mentioned, the city will be convening a new commission on children and families that hopefully will help us make some progress on some of those issues, if not um, coming up with recommendations, but also identifying what those are and really listening to the community and, 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 and going further um, to try and help make, that, uh, make progress in that arena. Um, traded sector uh, in economic development. So, this is some good news. We've, we've made some great progress in attracting major investment in recent years. In Gresham, we have nearly $17 million in development projects that are happening right now or have been completed just recently. I thought I'd line out some of them for you because you know, uh, probably know some of these folks. Teeny Foods just had a $12 million expansion. Seiko Logistics, 20,000 square feet, $1.5 million worth of investment. Shamrock Foods, $1.2 million worth of investment. Grocery Outlet, $1.4 million worth of investment. Uh, 100, 185 square foot building. And here's, here's, here's another good one. Two new industrial spec spaces were completed in December, uh, which adds 400 and almost 425,000 square feet of new space. So that's good for, uh, uh, to have some flexible industrial space available as we go out and market or as we answer or respond uh, to leads. And two additional uh, industrial buildings are being built also for another 200,000 square feet. So as you can see from that list, we're finally starting to see some momentum uh, in the traded sector and some positive investment that's, that's starting to happen in the community. Uh, we recently hosted a national site selector who is deeply experienced in huge national and international economic development deals. We thought that it would be best to sit down with the top uh, folks in the industry for the entire world and find out where we're competitive, where we're not competitive, and sort of start to, to draft a plan to, to get us to be, uh, as the City Council's goal is to be the most competitive place, uh, not only in the Portland metropolitan region, but in the state of Oregon to, to, to do business. Um, we're going to consider a number of approaches as we talk about you know, trying to get better in, in that arena. We've made, some great, um, we've, made, we've made some great steps forward. We've got some, we've got some work to do, though, in terms, of, uh, in terms of providing the right package of incentives and the right um, uh, 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 things that will attract uh, companies to locate here. One of the things we did last 
uh, uh, just a few months back was the 66 industrial day review. So that's faster than anybody in the entire Portland metropolitan region, I think the entire state as well. That means that we've guaranteed in half the time what the state prescribes us to, to 120 day rules to, to uh, answer an industrial application. Now we can do that and we've guaranteed, we've committed the organization that we'll do that in 66 days, which is half the time that's allotted to us. Nobody else has memorialized that. I won't tell you that there aren't other people that can, can hit that number, but there's very few that have memorialized it and can do it um, uh, uh, as well as, as our folks at the city of Gresham can. So I'm very excited about that as one of the first pieces forward as we start to talk about uh, incentive packages. Uh, small business, uh, small business efforts, as you know, that's something near and dear to my heart, and I know a lot of you. Um, a little, as Warner mentioned, a little over a year ago, the Garage to Storefront program wrapped up, had 144 new businesses, uh, over a quarter million square feet of retail that was previously vacant is now programmed. Most all of those businesses are still in business, which is great. Um, and the thing about that that's intriguing is that it was great during an awful time of our economy. So the recession was going and we were successful. And I don't think you probably, I don't think probably too many people would have said we're going to be as successful as we were on this. So my question is, and the question that the council's been wrestling with is what, what about in a different time? What about in a time where investment's starting to free up and some things are starting to happen and companies are letting loose of some money? What about if we had a garage to storefront program or an iteration of it during this time right now. What could we do with that? And so that's what we're looking at right now, Garage to Storefront 2.0. Um, the, the council has been very direct with uh, the folks that are working on it to say, you know, we don't want something that just kind of gets us there. We want to be aggressive and we want to market that aggressiveness. And that's where I think as we talk about the partnerships that we have, the city has with education, with the business community is all important for us to all to come together and figure out how we move that forward in terms of job recruitment because education plays a piece in it. Small business plays a piece in it. Um, all of those things, that partnership is going to be very important as we move forward to the betterment uh, of the of the city. Um, I should mention that the, the Catalyst site in, uh, in Rockwood, the former Fred Meyer site, um, phase one of our redevelopment efforts is, are, is in the work, are in the works right now. Um, and it involves, of course, uh, transforming that, the former Rockwood community office that's there now into restaurant spaces. So uh, uh, Josh Fuhrer, who um, you know from the city council, who happens to be a developer, is now um, the urban renewal director, and it's been fun to watch him as somebody that grew up in Rockwood and is passionate about Rockwood and has the development experience uh, to come to the table and try and start to, to make the pieces work on that thing. So we're real excited about uh, where, that's, where that's headed. Um, in terms of technology, we've been focused uh, 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 on conventional services, of course, like economic development. But we've also been working on technology as things are changing, and you all know it. Um, Things are different. Government has to act different. The days of probably having people come to a big monolithic building called City Hall and sit in a meeting probably are, are probably getting close to being behind us. So we have to figure out other ways to connect to busy lifestyles, people that are raising kids or people that are retired or whatever. How do we get them involved into um, the municipal conversation? So one of the things that, that I'm proud about this organization is the My Gresham app. So if you don't have it, go to the App Store, download My Gresham. Anything, I see Councilor French has it out. So he's got it up there. He's probably giving feedback on this speech as we speak. <laughs> but, because you can do that. <laughs> but anyway, the, the My Gresham app will give you everything you need to know, I think. And if there's something on there that, that it doesn't take you to, that you think is important, let us know. Because we've, we've just developed it. It's all out there right now. Um, and it's, um, I think it's probably better than any governmental app you're, you're going to find. Um, really proud of the work that, that the organization has done uh, uh, on that. Um, okay, and then technology, on technology, one of the things, in, and I know many of you have heard me uh, talk about this before, but our wastewater treatment plant. And I never thought when I ran for office that I'd spend a whole bunch of time talking about wastewater treatment plants, but it seems to be that, that, that that's what I spent a lot of time talking about. Uh, you know, we took the wastewater treatment plant was the city's uh, largest energy user. So we spent more money uh, for electricity on that building and, and that system than we did anywhere else in the organization. So about 10 years ago, 
staff came forward and they said, we think that we can start to make, to get this building to produce its own energy. So we started making little steps forward here and there as a, as a long-term investment strategy. Uh, so now, 10 years later, the wastewater treatment plant uh, is, a, is a power plant. It produces its own power, and it saves about $800,000 a year to, to, to the ratepayers. So it's been a phenomenal thing to watch it go through that process. So it's, it's green, it's right for you know, uh, uh, the environment, but it's also green and right for our pocketbooks. And the return on investment was, was so strong on it that that's why we kept you know, plowing forward on that. And we've done that a lot with technology. Our street lights, we took them from uh, costing money into you know, saving money now with pr pr changing them all out to LED street lights. The lighting's better, it's brighter, it's more efficient, so it's better for the environment, and again, it saves us money. So we're always trying to find ways, and, and quite frankly, we've had to try and find ways to get creative uh, in terms of technology and, and, and ways to save money. Uh, it just happens to be um, that it's also really good for the environment, which I think is a good thing for, for good Oregonians. Um, again, I could, could go on at length about uh, all of the things that were in the state of the city, but I just kind of wanted to give you a high level of sort of the economic development and some of the other things uh, that are going on in the city and would just open it up to a dialogue, questions and answer. I think it's, it's very valuable and helpful to me to have these conversations as, as we go forward and do the work that we do at the city and, and uh, enjoy it a lot more than reading off of a stack of papers. So anyway, so thank you for having me and certainly uh, open it up for dialogue. So we're going to take this one away from you. Okay. I guess. This on it. Oh, I think that's okay. just done. There. And then I guess you can use okay. this one. Hopefully that's working. So I'll start off. Um, Springwater Trail, can you give us an update uh, on the long-term plan to make this a more usable, more manageable uh, facility? In terms of the- Safety, yeah. uh, usability, mostly safety. Yeah, I'm on the Springwater Trail probably five times a week, and so I'm very familiar with you know, some of the issues that, that are there and that aren't there. We have um, obviously as, um, you know, as some of the public safety issues and the homelessness issues have become more pronounced uh, in the suburbs all across the country, suburbs all across the country are trying to figure out how to deal with that. We are no different. Um, we have spent um, the last two years trying to get into this, this work of homelessness and public safety because we, we had never been there before, partially because um, there hadn't been a need, so we had relied on partners to do that work, the faith community, um, service organ or um, other nonprofit organizations that we had partnered with. But we figured out that, that we were not going to get anywhere if we didn't figure out how, you know, how to bring the right people together that have experience in this. So we have the organization has uh, partnered with Join, which is a, a homeless outreach uh, uh, group, to try and go and do their work on the trail, and the the, the people that join helps are the people that are on the trail. They're generally the, um, the folks that don't want any help. They, they just, they're drug aff afflicted, um, don't want to get a job, that sort of thing. And so join takes these folks and says, no, we want you. And they get them into living and they get them help and they have a pretty good success rate. And so we have partnered with those folks and we're starting to see you know, some progress on that. But th there's work to do. I can tell you, um, you know, I run from the park you know, out uh, you know, towards boring, and um, and you, you will see some things that you know some from time to time can give you concern, um, but you know uh, we'll, we'll continue to work on it. But for the most part, the Springwater Trail is pretty safe. Thank you. Um, I want to go back and talk a little bit about um, something that we've been talking about and so when you were mentioning garage to storefront um, in reality we we don't have many new buildings coming into the Gresham area overall so the amount of retail or storefront space actually is, is act hard to come by so what that really means is that we need to have new investment come into town 
But the challenge there is the return on that investment, what you can get in rents or that, whether it's office or whether it's storefront, um, is not the same as you might get elsewhere in the metropolitan area. But the building costs are exactly the same. So I, I don't think it's really the incentive right now directly to the small business, but what I do think it is, is some incentives, so I've, I know I've got some counselor ears here as well, but it really is incentive to the development, the investor, yeah. whether it's some reduction in SDCs yeah. or some way to move those out in the future so yeah. that they can actually offer rent levels that are achievable for the people who want to do business here. So I can tell you from my perspective, we are really very short of that space yeah. and a real concern that now's the time for Gresham. Mm -hmm. um, our land is more affordable here, but if, if we don't see that happen in the next three to four years, then you, you miss the cycle where okay. interest rates are affordable yeah. and banks are lending. So yeah. I think it's really critical to think about what incentives we can offer for key places in our community that we want to see new investment come. Yep, yeah. I, could, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. And as we talk about the success of the garage to storefront was 5,000 square feet or less, but the success of the garage to storefront wasn't necessarily the entrepreneurs, it was the building owners, because most, most of the entrepreneurs were leasing from the building owners. So owning that SDC in perpetuity or, or waiving that SDC gave them, as you know, much more of an impetus to invest in the entrepreneur um, because they were going to own that SDC and it gave them, you know, for tenant improvement money instead of putting it here or there. So the question is, is there's buildings that are over 5,000 square feet um, that are problematic, you know, throughout the city, and they probably provide every bit as much blight and, you know. Um, so we need, in my mind, we need to start answering the entire question over 5,000 square feet. And again, as I said, we, we, the city council wants to be incredibly bullish. I mean, there's, there's, um, there's really no holding back on, on what we can do because I really believe, as you just iterated, we have got to play the long game when we talk about economic development. Will it cost money up front? Probably. But what is the return on, you know, on that? And, and I think we can probably uh, uh, delineate out and show a return on investment on all of those that could be pretty substantial. I'm appreciative that it's in your mind that, yeah. and that 5,000 is a, a good threshold. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, welcome, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, congratulations on uh, all your accomplishments. Um, I'm Michael Patrick with uh, m, m Realty, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about <coughs> residential housing. You know, in all of uh, Gresham, 970, 080, there's 146 active listings. That's all that the houses are for sale. What can the city do? I know we see that Metro is in the room and they control a lot of the land use, but what can the city do to help us create more opportunities for new construction? Because new construction really drives the residential market. And it's really difficult today. We're in a bidding war again because of the shortage of, shortage of the inventory. Yeah. And bringing in all these new businesses, the employees and the owners have to live someplace. And there's a lot of people that live outside of our, our city. That, that because of the lack of uh, residential opportunities. So can you address that, please? Okay, y yeah. Um, let me ask you a question, though, as a realtor. What is the number one thing that you hear people talk about? Well, you don't answer that. What is it? It's schools. Okay, yeah. it's schools. And that is continually what I'm continually hearing are folks my age, you know, that have kids um, that are leaving the community. They're leaving because... And whether it's right or wrong, some of it could be perception, but they're leaving because of the school situation. The that is the reality. And, and, and we've, got, we've got to figure that out and we've got to talk about it. Now, I have, ne you know, in, in 12 years of elective office, I've, I, I've never really weighed in to the school issues because they have an independently elected school board um, of citizens and, you know, they do their thing. And I'm not going to tell them how to do it, but it has become to a point where we're hearing it so much. And of course, having myself, kids in the school system. I can identify with some of the things that they're saying. And we've got to figure that out. I mean, and I think, again, this is another place where the business community, um, education, and, and city government, state government need to come together and, and, and start, 
start to figure that out because that's one of the biggest things I hear in residential real estate. In terms of helping new um, development, we know how to do that. Uh, we did it in Pleasant Valley. We're doing it right now. Everybody thought Pleasant Valley was gone the way of the recession and it was never going to happen. Well, I'll tell you, I would put the team at the city of Gresham all the way through in every discipline. Uh, you put them and you give them a charge to say, figure out how to make this happen that makes sense to the developer and he can still have a return on investment and that it makes sense to the, the rest of the people in the community that are paying taxes. If you can do that, let's you know, figure that out. Well, they did. They figured it out. Pleasant Valley's out of the ground now. You can see all that stuff that's starting to go in there. Um, and there's a master plan for that that, as you know, was years ago. But we can continue. That's developable residential land. And so we will continue. My promise to you is we will continue to do what we can do to be partners in that to help perpetuate that because it is important. Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> it's time up. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, for the restraint that you have shown in your um, leadership. When at a time you could have just said, okay, let's just put, let's just dump this here because that's the funding, and I'm talking about Rockwood. Let's just, let's just do this because that's where the funding is. The restraint that you've shown in not making that decision, which I felt would ultimately have been a bad decision for the community, <coughs> it was a hard thing for you to do, and I appreciate the fact that you did that. And, um, whether the, the new thing is going to work or not, I don't know, but I appreciate what the courage that it took for you to do that Thank at the time. So I'm going to sh switch gears. The Government Affairs Committee for the Chamber is up to their eyeballs in opposing, mostly, and supporting a few things that are going on in Salem. Is there something that we should know about as a Chamber that's going on um, either needing opposition or support as a city is relating to state governments. There's something we should know about that maybe we can help partner because we're down there anyway. Yeah. Um, let us know, or could you tell me? Yeah, so in terms of, I know that we've shared the legislative agenda with, with the committee, our legislative agenda that was adopted uh, by the council. And, and in that document, it's clearly lined out some of the things that we're, we're tracking. One of them is uh, the strategic uh, investment zone, rural, urban, we're all aware of that. Um, we continue. Um, uh, to track that and, and we track anything that really is that uh, as as you would know as former speaker anything that has local control issues we continue to track and again as you know things change so quickly that things are coming at us but I really believe that the number one thing we can do uh, to help this community is to talk about education I just really believe that K through 12 we've got to talk about it and we've got to figure out how to get schools functioning at a higher level uh, in this community some people will say poverty that poverty is the entire issue, and I don't buy that. I mean, I, I just don't think that that's, that's the, ent the entire issue that we're dealing with with low-performing schools. And I know that uh, that doesn't just rest with the school board. It rests with the state. And so whatever we can do to that extent, we've, it seems like we focused on higher ed for a long time, which we, we still should. But then somehow K through 12 just kind of, you know, if you turn around and, um, for instance, you, if, if you get on Zillow right now in this neighborhood, get on Zillow. There's one to 10 is the rating of schools. One to 10, one being the best, 10 being the worst. And everybody that's looking for a house is on Zillow. Not a lot of good information there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you go, Gresham's most wealthiest community, you'll have a one for your grade school, you're rated a one, you'll have a five for your middle school and a five for your high school. So that's an issue and we gotta figure out, it's an issue for what, these homes will, set, will sell for. It's an issue for who will come in to these homes all throughout the community. Um, it, you know, I, I don't know what, the, I don't have a magic solution to it. I know that money is not just the answer, um, but we got to figure out as a community, you know, how, how, how we're going to get our arms around getting these schools better. I think I agree with you that the whole issue of education is multifaceted. Yeah. It's not necessarily the health of the buildings, the quality of the teachers, or it's not one individual thing. But it does say something when the CFO of the largest car dealership in our area, and it's not Gresham Ford, couldn't get appointed to the budget committee for the school district. That is a systemic issue. It's not only a rah-rah for the 
the chamber and the business community to, be, to help the schools, but it says something about maybe the priorities that they're choosing. Um, so I, I'm just yeah. making that as a yeah. comment, not as a criticism, and you can't solve that as well. No, but, but, but one of the things that we can do is talk about it, you know, for, you know, there's a whole school of thought you shouldn't talk about something you can't control or have no control over but nobody else is talking about it except for parents of kids and I'm tired of them coming to me and saying you know you got to do something about schools you got to do something about schools you got to do something about schools or dealing with you know the after school conversation with my children I mean we've got to do better and and that's going to take us all together doing that thank you so mayor would you um <laughs> I'm waiting for the Would you tell us a little bit about what the city's doing uh, to prepare for the marijuana initiative that's coming in July? <clears throat> well, besides that, <laughs> um, so we held a uh, we held an informational forum. There's been a subcommittee appointed of uh, of the Gresham City Council uh, to work on the issue. Uh, we had a town hall esque um, meeting uh, to talk about you know where you know issues that the community wanted to bring up um, and it was very pro the pro marijuana side I don't know that it was a good sampling ballot of you know of the entire community so we're going to continue to work through those issues I don't think anybody um, I think we all want the same thing I mean we, we want to protect our neighborhoods we want uh, if they're going to be these facilities that they're in the right place and not the wrong place, which they're not by schools or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think all I can promise you is that there's going to be um, um, a high level of common sense that comes out from, from the council level in terms of, of talking about the policies as we go forward. But we're very much right in the middle right now of going through all of that policy sausage making. So if there's anybody that wants to be involved in that, send us an email, pass it. Other questions? Would you, uh, Mayor, would you talk a little bit about the, uh, the status of the paid council and mayor situation? I will talk very little about the paid status of the council. I know that <laughs> we Listen, ignore the conflict. Yeah, um, you know, this was a question that's come up numerous amount of times. Um, it's come up at every charter review. The, the charter, our charter prescribes that we'll, we'll have a charter review every eight years. Um, and it's come up the last, I don't know, at least the last two charter reviews. The last, the last time we had it, the committee said, yeah, we think this, I think, we think that you should, that the council should be paid, the jobs changed, et cetera. Um, but now's not the right time in a recession and you need to, you know, you need to get a committee together, figure this out. So we did that. We, we waited, we waited, we waited. We put a, a committee together. And now the question, that committee has come back with it. Um, the question is, uh, do you believe that there should be a process to pay mayor and city council? And if you do, that's, that's the yes or no question that's on the ballot. Um, the process that's defined in the ballot title would be that the finance committee made up of, of uh, Gresham citizens would be determining um, appropriate levels of compensation up to a max. So we put, we put a max in the ballot title so that there was a, a hard stop on it. Um, so it's 45 for the mayor's position is 45 percent um, of the Multnomah County chair's wage and for the council it's 45 percent of Metro Council which equates to uh, I think a ceiling of like 60 some thousand dollars for the mayor's position and uh, tw what is it tw 30 20 21 or 22 or something for uh, the council position at a very maximum and there are citizens that are leading this effort we sure you can connect you with. Is there any other um, city the size of Gresham in the state of Oregon that doesn't pay their councilors and their mayor? Yes. Not, not, uh, let's see, Salem has, there's none that have, I don't believe that there's any this size that have a zero dollar figure. Okay. And how many hours a week would you say you spend just in your mayor position? You know, it really depends. Uh, it depends. I've gotten better at saying no to some things, you know, <laughs> that I used to just for sanity and, and my family life. Um, but it's incredibly hard. I mean, if you, if you stacked up just the reading, 
that you want your elected body to read, the stack's going to be this high. Um, so there's a, it is a lot of work beyond just whatever you're doing, you know, in the community, et cetera, et cetera. But it just depends on the week. We've had weeks where we've been, you know, at 50, 60 hours. We've had weeks where I've been at five. You know, it just it depends on what's going on. Other times of the year are, are busier, you know, than others. Um, my whole thing is beyond beyond my time because I'm I'm not going to be here forever. To, I know it pleases some people, but, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you got to think about what does the community want and, and what do you expect of them? I mean, you, in, in some respects, you kind of get what you pay for. You know, I, I've gotten the opportunity to to meet some mayors from across the country through the United States Conference of Mayors. Some of them, some of these, uh, some of them that are around my age that are, you know, getting paid much, much more than what we have in the ballot title by almost double. They're showing up to work every day, trying to make their hometown the best that it can be, and they're working every single day in partnership with their organization and to push the organization forward. And, and, and by doing that, that means that they have to be engaged regionally. So they, you know, Portland, uh, state, you know, you gotta be involved in the state, you gotta be involved in, in, in the federal government. We've been very successful in federal grants out of the federal government only because we've gotten on a plane and we've went and met the people and shook hands with them and went belly to belly with the people that make the decisions and we've been successful at that. But it's, it's a lot to expect a volunteer to leave their time with their family or their business or whatever and to go in, in, in to go do these things. So the question is, the question on the ballot is, do you think that the position ought to be paid? Straight up, that's the question with this max salary. If you do, then it's a yes vote. If you don't, it's a no vote, you know? And then if it's a yes, then the citizens that, that are on the finance committee will then do all of the research that they need to do to figure out who does this, who does that, how much time is spent here, what is spent here, and come up with an appropriate uh, uh, amount. So at one point, um, I know that the city was, um, staffing levels were just down to lean and mean. Uh, have the staffing levels improved? And if so, how much? Well, I mean, I think we're, <clears throat> of course, we're just, you know, heading into budget uh, the couple weeks here. So um, the manager will propose the budget and I'm not, you know, well, I know a little bit of what's in there. I'm not completely sure of, of what the staffing levels are to answer your question specifically. But yes, over the last, eight years we have cut and we've cut and we've cut. Um, and they, we've gotten to a point where in some departments it's been pretty anemic, but the reality is we, we didn't have any other choices. I mean, th that was where we were. So um, we're, we're getting them back up in some areas, but there's, some, there's other areas that you look at and you say, for instance, our parks department uh, 15 years ago had 18, 19, 20 people in it. Now we're down to a couple people that mow the lawns. And will we ever get back up to that level? Probably not, unless something significantly changes in, in the revenue structure in the state of Oregon on how local governments are funded. Um, so the new reality is, is that we, you know, we're asking people to do you know, a couple different jobs all at once. And luckily, we've been able to keep a lot of really good people, the city manager, you know, at the top of that to, to keep the organization moving. Not really a question, Mayor, but I'd just like to thank you personally for all the effort and time you and the council have put in. I feel that we as a town are certainly a, a lot better place to live because we have business people in helping run the organization. And I too agree that we need some business people on the school boards because for some reason, um, maybe we can say no a little easier to some things that we can do without in the schools. I'd like to see the schools better, but I would also like to see the um, mayor and the council paid. Yeah. Thank you for coming today. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate that. So <laughs> What's your sense of uh, cooperation with the other three river cities in, in uh, in regional projects uh, and meeting with them. Yeah, no, I, I think um, I think it's good. Uh, Mayor Doust, of course, have had a little bit longer working relationship, and Mayor Smith, obviously, a little bit longer uh, working relationship. The uh, Mayor Tosserud of Fairview is new, and he's kind of getting his you know his sea legs, and and uh, we've met a couple times. But I've I've sort of um, 
you know, there's, there's, there's two different areas where the mayors get together. One of them is through East Metro Economic Alliance. So we meet once a month. We're all on the board of East Metro Economic Alliance. And we can sit there and we can talk about a whole host of issues in terms of economic development, education, all of these things uh, uh, that are going to move the region forward. We do that once a month. We also have a once a month regional mayor's meeting, which is all of the mayors in the entire region get together, and we do that too. So I feel pretty good about uh, where they're at. Some of the issues obviously are different. Um, many of them are the same because it's all of East County. Um, but I have, <clears throat> I have been a proponent to push the three cities, uh, Troutdale, Fairview, Wood Village, to really get together, you know, and under Mayor Weatherby, they were they were kind of doing that, those three together, because a lot of their issues are very, very, very similar. And there's a lot of economies of scale, as, as they have found out in, in, in the way they approach things. So um, I, I would say that, uh, you know, Doug texts me, the relationship's good. It's just, uh, it's different. I mean, we're all really busy. Great. Any other questions? <clears throat> Captain Neal. <laughs> As opposed to Captain and Neal. Um, I had an opportunity to leave Gresham for a couple of years and move to Denver and live in several of their communities that uh, they don't, they, they have their towns, but they don't have towns, yeah. uh, like Centennial and yeah. Inglewood. And it made me really fall in love with Gresham. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm with Mount Hood Cabin. A shuttle and somebody said was talking about Gresham and they used the term uh, Portland's stepsister. It really offended me because Good. you know because you know, I'm in love with it. I'm yeah. so glad to be home I can't tell you but um, and I was downtown and we went to the opening of the Louisiana restaurant yeah. and I was just looking yeah. at the number of vibrant restaurants and yeah. the choices that we have down there and I just, uh, for future thinking, what is the city going to do or have in plans to promote who we are at the core uh, of, of a wonderful community? It is a, it is a, it is a great question, and it's one that, um, uh, as business people that are on the council, we've been wrestling with for a lot of years. Because if it were private business, um, I could do one heck of a job promoting this community, right? I mean, if you gave me the resources, we could make some really cool videos and highlight some really cool things that would totally change the paradigm of what of the outside world thinks of what we all know. The reality is, in government, that's tough to do because it's a big check to write. And um, we have wrestled with that as a city and as a city council to say, in terms of branding, um, how, do we, how, how can we do that in partnership, again, with uh, people that are already doing this? And again, I think that'll be a good conversation for the chamber to have. We all have you know, so much to gain, and particularly if you have the word Gresham in your, in your uh, business title, you know, Gresham Ford or, Gre you know, I mean, those are folks that, that need to be involved in, and at the table, and they will be. But, um, you know, I mean, it, it's hard when you're, when you, it's hard when you, the, the Gresham that you just described is the Gresham that I know, and it's the Gresham that I love, and it's the Gresham that I want. So it's hard when you start talking about, um, people leaving the community because of issues that, that we have. And you know that you got to talk about those issues because if we don't, we're never going to fix them. And that's sort of where I am with schools. You know, we got to talk about them or we're not going to fix them. But in talking about them, you can draw some attention that you might not want to draw or a view that we might not want to draw. What I would challenge all of you to do is to, is to say exactly what you just said. This is what I love and here's why. Sometimes I think we can be so much harder on ourselves than what everybody else really thinks of us as. You know? So I think we've got to reinvest back our civic pride, uh, our community's you know, uh, appreciation, and start delineating out and highlighting our successes because we have them. We certainly have them. I mean, look at, I mean just drive into this parking lot and look at this beautiful landscape around us. You don't get that everywhere. You know? so, um, and you don't, get, you don't get the human connection that you just described uh, in many places. And, and that is what is special about Gresham and it's worth protecting. You know, it's what enabled a guy that started a pizza parlor that didn't, you know, to, to get to know people and relationships and to try and, you know, to be mayor someday of his hometown. That's what we gotta protect. Um, and I think, I think we can do that. 
I don't know what the, you know, we can't write a check for, you know, a million dollar advertising budget or take out an ad at the Super Bowl, but we can start and our communications department has started to push, you know, things out from communications about highlighting positive things and that sort of thing. It's a different day. It's a different day in journalism. You know, it used to be we had page two and three of the Metro section every day of the Oregonian. Well, of course, you know, I mean, so it's a different day. Um, the outlook has... Yeah, yeah. The outlook has done. Uh, the outlook has done. You know, as of recent, a really good job of highlighting some people and things that are great about this community that were just going by the wayside. And instead of, you know, instead of talking about those things and highlighting those things, we were letting other people, you know, define who we were. Which was the easy thing to do is to grab the crime report and publish it in the paper, right? So we're better than that, and we'll, we'll figure this out. But I challenge you and everybody you know to talk about the positives, talk about you know, the, the, the things that we can do to make this better, because this, this place is worth protecting, and it's gonna take all of us to do that. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you very much, appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor, for being here and for uh, serving as a, a Q&A uh, a man willing to take the hard questions and uh, throw back the answers every time. Very, very good. Appreciate your leadership very much. Thank you all for coming today. I want to again acknowledge our sponsors today, uh, Portland General Electric and Riverview Community Bank and the Gresham Barlow School District. Remember that these events would not happen without sponsors such as those I just named. And thank you for uh, taking one of the bank pens that Larry has left on the table and <laughs> filling out the evaluation form uh, before you leave and Mayor Bemis will be looking for your evaluation of your performance. <laughs> anyway, uh, your ticket out the door to go back to work is the evaluation form. Just leave it on the table. Have a good afternoon, folks. Thank you. <laughs>